Okay guys, let's get into the nitty gritty of how you can actually get started and make your own things. Now broadly speaking, there are two big points to focus on with 3D printing. That's the software side of things and the hardware side of things. Software is about designing or finding a 3D model on your computer and preparing it for 3D printing. And the hardware side is about correctly setting up your 3D printer for actual printing and looking after it when things inevitably go wrong. This section will focus on the software side of things and then we'll look at the hardware side of things in the next section. We're going to go into quite a bit of detail here to show you what's out there, but don't worry if it's too much to take in because the basics are actually really simple. So let's talk about 3D modeling on your computer. You'll often hear this referred to as CAD modeling, computer-aided design, a term coined in 1959 because back then it was actually a big deal if something used a computer. If it was named these days, we'd probably just call it design because, well, what don't we do on computers these days? As you can see on this terribly exciting infographic, computer-aided design has evolved in many iterations over the last decades and it's been used to design everything from buildings to fighter jets. Once used exclusively by wealthy engineering companies with super expensive computers, these days CAD looks like this. This is a 3D model I threw together in about 10 minutes. It's a so-called ear saver, which is a simple device that makes wearing a face mask all day a little more comfortable by keeping the elastic straps off of the ears. It was quick and easy and painless to design, and it digitally represents something that I want to build in real life. Everything is to scale, and you can even throw in colors. I made this particular model using a free piece of 3D modeling software called SketchUp, but there are loads of free softwares out there, all with different strengths, and I encourage you to go and find one that works for you. Tinkercad, 3D Slash, SketchUp, and FreeCAD are some great places for beginners to start. But designing your own 3D model isn't for everyone, and if you're just starting out, it's probably not the best first thing that you should be doing. Instead, there are websites out there that have huge libraries of free, awesome 3D models designed by other people and hosted on websites like Thingiverse. Here, you can browse until you see something cool, or you can search for specific 3D models for something you need. There's a lot of stuff out there, free and paid for, so look around until you find something you like. I recommend you start out simple, something not too large or complicated. You can scale up your ambitions later, but for now we just want to focus on getting your first 3D print out of the computer and into the real world. In any case, whether you're downloading a model or making your own, what you'll be left with is a 3D model in the STL file format, standing for stereolithography. If you find a file that's got an STL file extension, chances are it can be 3D printed. So be sure that when you're creating and exporting your own models, that you export them as STL files, as there are many other 3D model formats out there that might not work with the slicer, which is the next step. In the last video, we talked about how 3D printers build objects in layers, printing hundreds or even thousands of two-dimensional flat layers at a time. Well, as the name suggests, the slicer's job is to slice your 3D model, the one in your STL file, into individual layers. Once the slicer has created all of these layers, it saves the instructions in a file of what's called G-code. Within this G-code file are all the instructions for exactly where the printer should move the print nozzle, what temperatures it should use, how much plastic it should print, and so on. So we give the G-code file to the printer, and off it goes. So that's the simple version of what happens, but you might be asking, why don't you just give the original STL file of your model straight to the printer? Well, the answer is partly because 3D printers really aren't very smart. They don't have much more processing power than a pocket calculator. So you do need a more powerful computer to interpret your 3D model and turn it into really simple step-by-step -step instructions for your 3D printer. But slicers also perform a lot of really other important jobs. They give you complete control over exactly how your printer behaves, with everything from the position, orientation, number of different models in your print, to the thickness of individual layers, and even what the printer should print inside the hollow spaces inside your model. So we'll take a look. So here we are in Cura. So what we see in front of us is the virtual print bed. So this is the area that represents the print bed on your actual printer. Now you can select what printer you've got over here. So at the moment you see I've got the Corality Ender 3 and my Monoprice Select Mini, but you can use the Add Printer one here to add any other printer that you like. So we're going to pick our file using this Open File button. In this case, we're going to take a look at the ear saver that I just made using SketchUp. And here it is. And you can use different buttons on your mouse to navigate around and view your model. So the first thing we're going to do is position it on the print bed. Now in this case it's pretty ideal, but just to show you how we do this, if you select the model on the left hand side here, you've got these controls to move it around as you like, or you can move it in a specific direction using these arrows. I can then 
scale the model if I'd like to. So if I'd like to make it a specific amount larger or smaller, but in this case, I just want it to be the original scale because I measured it and it should fit nicely on my head. And then we've also got a tool here on the side to rotate the part as we like. And note that this can be particularly useful if your model isn't flat to the build plate. So let's say it's come in like this for some reason, you can use the lay flat button and it will make sure that it's nice and flat in the build plate, which makes it printable. Now there's no reason that you can't print more than one model at a time as long as you've got space on your print bed. Cura has a nice feature that if you right click on any model, you can multiply the selected model. So let's say that I want to add in two more of these or three more of these, I'll hit multiply and there they are. And you can lay them all out to your heart's content so long as you've got space on your bed. And there's no reason that they all have to be the same model either. So let's throw in one of these at the same time just for fun. And I'm going to multiply that. I'll probably put three of these down. I'm not actually completely sure what it is, but they might be useful. Okay, great. Do keep in mind though that the more parts you add to your build plate, the higher the chances of it failing. So definitely start out with just one object and scale up as you get more ambitious. Okay, now for the next step of our demo, we're going to be using a slightly more complicated model. This is the children's maker mask and I've chosen this because it quite nicely represents a few of the things that we want to talk about. So first off, let's talk about the material and the nozzle. So if you look at this bar here, you can see we can select different materials. And if you remember from the introduction video, we talked about a lot of these materials, ABS, nylon, PETG. We're going to select PLA because that's a nice, simple material we know is going to work. We can also select the nozzle size. By default, this is normally 0.4 millimeters on most printers, and it is on my Creality Ender 3, so I'm going to leave it set to that. Okay, so now let's talk about the printer settings. So on the top right here, if you click this bar, you'll have a menu pop up for your print settings. The first one on the top is the thickness of individual layers, ranging from 0.12 millimeters all the way up to 0.28 millimeters. Keep in mind these thicknesses will be slightly different depending on what printer you're using. Now, layer thickness is an important parameter. If the layers are thinner, that means there's going to be more layers and it's going to take longer. So I'll demonstrate this now. If we use a 0.12 millimeter height and I press slice down here, the slicer is now going to go ahead and start processing how it can do individual layers for this file. And now that the model is sliced, we can see that it's estimating it's going to take over 10 hours to do this print. Pretty long time. But if we choose a resolution that's much larger, so let's say we want a 0.28 millimeter layer height, you'll see the slice button reappears because this is a new type of file we haven't sliced yet. I'll hit slice again and we'll see what it comes out at this time. And as we can see, with these thicker layers, we've now got the print time down to 4 hours and 19 minutes. So we've just cut off almost 6 hours by using thicker layers. And in the case of the Maker Mask and a lot of other models, you can get away with thick layers. Really, you only need thin layers when you want to have a lot of detail on your model. Now, before we talk about infill support and adhesion, let's take a look at this preview button here. So when we click the preview button, it's going to show us exactly what the layer by layer slice of our model looks like. This part is really cool. So this is also color coordinated. So if you click the color scheme here, you'll see that the outside shell is highlighted in red. The infill, which we'll talk about in a second, is highlighted in orange and the top and the bottom are yellow. So what this part of the software allows us to do is to zoom in and choose individual layers to see exactly how the printer is going to print it. This can be really useful when you want to make sure that little details are correct. The slider on the right allows you to choose the z-axis layer and the slider on the bottom allows you to see the path of the nozzle across each individual layer. So you have complete control over seeing how the entire print is going to go. So we'll close the color scheme window there and next up let's talk about a really important feature that is infill. So infill is what your slicer does to the hollow areas inside your print. Whenever you have a hollow area, and in the case of the Maker Mask I'm going to highlight this one down here, you could fill it with solid material, but if you've got a really large model that's got a really large hollow area, that's going to use a lot of material and often structurally you just don't need all that material. So the orange stuff is the infill and currently I've got it set to about 10% which basically means that 10% of this area is going to be filled with material and the other 90% is just going to be air. So you can see what this looks like here and I can go up and down a little bit just to demonstrate what that looks like. Remember you're looking at the orange parts here. Now if I were to set the infill all the way up to let's say 90% and now slice again. So you can see that there is now way more infill in this space. So if I scroll down here through the different layers, you can see it's almost completely solid. Now this is where another one of Cura's features comes in handy. If you look down here next to the print time, it tells you exactly how much material is going to be used in grams and meters. 
and you'll find that as you adjust the infill settings, the amount of material that you use will greatly increase or decrease. So this can also be a really good way to save material. So for this print, I'm going to be using 20%. That should be plenty to give me the strength I need, but also to make sure I don't use too much material. Okay, so now let's talk about support. Support structures are automatically generated by your slicer and they help your 3D printer to print things that would otherwise fail because they need to be supported from underneath. So a file like this one won't be able to print without support. If you look underneath here, you can see an area highlighted in red. And if you imagine how this prints layer by layer, and I'll quickly slice it to show you, I can print the sides here, but there's nothing to support this piece in the middle. So if I go layer by layer, as it prints, it'll do this and this and this, but as it gets to this point, it's going to struggle because it's suddenly going to have to print all this material basically in thin air. Now it's worth noting that sometimes 3D printers can do something called bridging, where they can print across a large gap, but this gap is probably too large for bridging, which means it will probably fail. So I'm going to hit the support button here and add in support automatically. So if I press the slicer again, Okay, so now you can see there's a whole new amount of material that's been added to support this gap. This light blue stuff here is the support material, and if I scroll down through this, you can see that it's basically an extra structure that has been added in that will support this bridge here as it's built. And when your print is done, you can remove that support structure afterwards, and what you'll be left with is the original model highlighted in red. But now back to the Maker Mask, this has been specifically designed so that it can safely print without support. So we don't really need to add it here and we're going to leave it out. Now the final tick box here is called adhesion. Adhesion is basically little tricks that the slicer can perform to help your model stick to the print bed in these early layers. So if I click this button, Cura will attempt to add in something called a brim or a raft to help the first layer stick. If I hit the slice button, I'll show you what I mean by that. So, now you can see we've got this extra bit on the bottom of the model highlighted in light blue that is the brim. The brim is basically extra bits of material that are printed just on the first layer that help to make sure that the first layer doesn't peel off the print bed. When your print is complete, you can remove this brim and your model will look as it normally would. Brims can be really useful and I do recommend playing around with them, but they're also a little bit of a pain because sometimes you have to cut them off afterwards. So if possible, try printing your model without them and if that doesn't work, try adding a brim. So you've got your layer height, your infill settings, your support and your adhesion all ready to go, which means this is now ready to print. So in the bottom right here, you have an option to save the file to G-code, which you can then load onto your printer with a USB stick. Or if you have a printer attached over USB, you should have the option down here to send your file to the printer over USB. Once you've done that, you can use the monitor tab here to monitor your print while it's printing. And that's it for the basics of software. So join us again in the next video where we'll be talking about hardware, setting up, using and maintaining your 3D printer.